So what we've done, what we looked at in the case study, we've specified the catchment, the sub areas and the reaches. We've specified the input rainfall as IFTs, temple patterns, aerial reduction factors, routing parameters and losses. We've run RORB. We've produced simple hydrographs, ensemble hydrographs and Monte Carlo hydrographs. Uh, we've compared the outputs to a stream flow based uh, flood frequency analysis. And we could go back and then tweak the initial loss and continuing loss to tune the model up and then get something that's fit for purpose to model the hydrology of the Delatite River. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar covering rainfall runoff modeling in RORB. Now, I'm your host, Cray Price, with the International Water Training Institute. And on behalf of the Australian Water School, we are excited to bring you some very relevant content today for modeling Australian rainfall and runoff. We normally start our webinars by welcoming a global audience, but today we'll zoom in a little bit more on our world map here. Um, a lot of our webinars are globally relevant. Um, hydrology and hydraulics supplies everywhere in the world, but being the Australian Water School, sometimes we focus just on our own land of uh, droughts and flooding rains here down under, and today's webinar is one of those. So we've got almost a thousand registered attendees, uh, most of whom are local right here in Australia. Um, I don't know who's joining us from the middle of the gold fields right there, but uh, it looks like we've at least got all the capital cities covered and some of the um, uh, other, other, other places as well. Um, and so welcome to those joining us from other overseas locations as well. We don't want to ignore you and uh, we do hope you find something relevant here. But as a disclaimer, today we're going to be talking about the Australian rainfall and runoff guidelines, Australian temporal patterns, uh, intensity, frequency, duration data, and so on. Um, so RORB is one of the rainfall runoff modeling options you might have among many. Uh, you may have other tools you'll want to have in your personal or professional toolbox, but if you're going to be in the water space in Australia, you're absolutely going to know what uh, RORB does, and more than likely, you'll need to know how to run it yourself. And so today's experts, as you see here, are very well placed to get us up to speed. Whether it's an introduction or a refresher for you, um, we've got Tony Latson and Matt Scora uh, on board with us. Um, if you can uh, turn turn on your cameras, uh, and uh, we'll get a bit of introduction for you. Now, uh, for Tony, if you Google key to concepts um, for Australian rainfall and runoff, like what's the terminology for AEP and uh, how do you convert to ARI, you're going to come up with Tony's blog. Um, Tony's also one of the key instructors on our Hydrology and Hydraulics Essentials course series, uh, which is available to complete at your own pace on demand. Um, and so I guess, Tony, let's let's have a little bit of an introduction from you, um, and maybe we'll start with a question. In addition to kind of what your background is, um, our topic today is ROARB. Now, when we talk about the R and R and A, R and R, that's rainfall and runoff. Uh, the There's an R and an R in ROARB, which is, I think, uh, for also has routing in there. But what's with the B? Um, I've heard <laughs> that there's, there's some sort of computer lingo, uh, R-O-R-B. What does that stand for? And then uh, tell us a little bit uh, more about uh, your background. Yeah, thanks, Cray. So um, I think the B bit state dates back to the mid-1970s when... when uh, Russell Mean and Eric Lawrenson first developed RORB, so the RLR bid, <laughs> runoff routing. They, when they changed computers, they made the last name, so it was ROR and then the name of the computer. So if you did it on a Mac, it'd be RORM, for example, or on a Windows machine, it might be ROW. And at one stage, they were working on a Burroughs computer. Uh, and so they, it became, it was just one of the many names. It had been RORT at one point, ROT. Okay. Then they changed it to a Burroughs and it became R-O-R-B. And then people liked the B and it stayed there ever since. <laughs> so Burroughs, I don't think, makes computers anymore. They didn't, didn't survive. But the, um, as far as we I got know. the legacy. That's we got good. the legacy. Yes. Yes, that's right. All right. So uh, tell so, us a little bit about your consulting business and what you do. Yeah. So uh, I'm a hydrologist. Um, uh, been working in the game for 40 odd years. And yeah. Um, have run a company called Maroka um, and mainly do do sort of hydrology consulting work. I had spent a bit of time at um, Monash Uni as a lecturer. I wrote a book on hydrology, a bit of time at uh, SKM, which is now Jacobs, uh, and um, and then, yeah, set up uh, my own business or joined uh, a guy called John Tilliard to set up Maroka about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Awesome. 
Well, thanks for that uh, that introduction. And I'm just thinking, R O R B. The R O is run off, so they split it into two words. Yes. So Australian rainfall and runoff could be R A R R O. Australian <laughs> rainfall and run off. If we if we went with that rule. Um, say, all right. Say it in a uh, pirate accent. Oh, there we go. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for that uh, intro. Um, uh, Tony will be our main uh, presenter today, but Matt's going to be in the background fielding your questions. Um, Matt, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. I understand you're from Hark. Now, I'm, I say that, you know, spe speaking of a uh, pirate accent, my American accent is probably just as bad. Hark, uh, I should say hack. Um, that's probably how you would pronounce it. Now, <laughs> when right. I first came to Australia, there was, I think, uh, Rorb was part of uh, Melbourne Water. Then it went to SKM, who got bought by Jacobs. Uh, how is Hark uh, pulled into this as the custodians? Maybe give us a little bit of the, the history of where it came from and um, how, uh, how you're now involved with it. And then also a bit about your career and how you came to be doing what you do. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. So, um, as Tony's already sort of indicated, Rob has been around since the mid 70s. It originally started uh, with Monash University through the work of uh, Eric Lawrenson and Russell May. Um, subsequently, in about 2005, uh, custodianship was then transitioned to SKM, um, primarily sort of steered by the work of Rory Nathan. Um, and uh, SKM subsequently became Jacobs, so they held custodianship until about 2015, at which point um, Hark became the custodians of Royal. And so uh, in terms of my career, I've been with Hark since pretty much the start, so about eight years now, and I do uh, a lot of work on the development of um, Royal and maintenance as well as some modernisation projects we're working on as well. Perfect. And Hark, that's hydrology and risk consulting. Do I have that right? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's uh, you do hydraulics as well, so it could be hydrology, hydraulic. Uh, ha Hark. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's have the poll results up here. Um, thanks to all the attendees for filling these out. This gives us a little bit of a feel for uh, the balance here, and it is almost perfectly balanced, half and half. Have you used it before? Have you used Rogue before? Now, one of the questions I uh, I have um, in terms of the uh, the background software that people have used, uh, <laughs> and Matt, this is uh, you can see this is what I was trying to get to with the uh, my, my my question to you just before we got on here. Um, look at the number of QGIS users um, compared to some of the others. Now, it's a little misleading because we've split Esri uh, products into two. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the GIS interfaces for uh, Roar. Uh, shortly. Um, and then in terms of other hydrologic modeling software, as I mentioned, you know, everybody has some choices here. Um, that it looks like we've got uh, a, a pretty even split between some of the methods that are out there. And this is something that I think would have been different. Our question number five here, which would have been different uh, maybe five, 10, 20 years ago um, when Rorb was being developed, uh, a lot of times people were just using the, hydro, uh, the hydrographs that came out of Rorb as direct uh, inflow into a hydraulic model. Look at the number of people who are doing rain on grid or direct precipitation modeling now, uh, where you may need to just uh, take some of the similar results and try to calibrate the two models to each other, or at least uh, validate them against each other um, to proceed. So that'll be uh, some points for our future discussions here. Um, so again, Matt will be in the background answering our questions. Um, Tony, while you're getting your screen up ready to share, I just <laughs> I wanted to mention a little bit of an anecdote here. Um, you can already go ahead and start uh, getting your screen ready to go. Um, but when, when I moved to Australia about 15 years ago, I went to the University of Melbourne Library. I wanted to know, okay, you know, I was coming from a 20-year career in the U.S. and how do I get started now from scratch in Australia? And I was like, how do you how do you do this? And I went and grabbed the Australian Rainfall and Runoff books um, out of the library, and they were, we still call them books, but they're PDFs. These were books at the time. You'd get them out the big the the, the big maps, um, and you'd you'd pull some runoff uh, some rainfall contours out of them, pop them into an equation, and bang, there's your peak flow. And I thought, awesome, that's great. And then it said, well, for the shape of your hydrograph, maybe run Rorp. So I went and got myself a copy, got a printed manual, and I thought I'd be good to go in a couple of hours. And days later, I gave up. <laughs> I hired myself somebody who, um, a, a consultant locally, who just came and sat down with me. I said, can you teach me this? And I, it was really uh, a bit humiliating for me because this is what I do. I do modeling, you know, and I, I've a hundred models. I've grabbed the manual and I just learned them from scratch. And I feel pretty confident that I can do that. Rorb was a whole different beast. 
And that's why I'm excited to be hosting this for you today. I wish I had had something like this available to me back 15 years ago uh, to go online and look up how to do this. Um, we're going to walk you through it. And just as a shameless plug, uh, this is a free webinar for you, but there is a course that this pulls into that Tony's going to be helping to uh, teach in a couple of weeks time. If you want to do this yourself and do it with our support and with, uh, with, with, with some experts there to help you get through it, uh, you'll see some links at the end to other resources, some of them free, some of them, uh, you know, I think it's well worth uh, the funds uh, to get uh, up to speed on ROARB yourself with some worked examples that you'll be able to go through with the experts. So stay tuned on the YouTube chat line. You'll see links there on our chat line here. You'll see some direct links there to be able to register for the course and get more resources. So with that long intro out of the way, let's turn it over to Tony and, uh, and then we'll have, uh, again, Matt answering questions in the background. Do keep it going in the background. We want this to be interactive. So get those questions in early. A lot of times people wait until the very end and then we can't answer your questions. We don't have time to answer your questions in the end. So get the questions in early so we can have this discussion. And those in the background, I know there's some expert users in the background who may be able to chime in as well. And we might uh, bring some of your answers uh, into the discussion as well. So with that out of the way, over to you, Tony. Yeah, thanks, Craig. I can already see a few tricky questions for Matt. So uh, yeah, he can start on that. So yeah, thanks for tuning into the pre-course webinar on the RORB Essentials for Water Modeling. Um, I'm just going to run through a few things about RORB. Uh, if you've used RORB before, I probably won't tell you a whole lot of new stuff, but i just give a bit of an overview of what RORB can do. Uh, so a tiny bit about me. I already said most of this. Um, Director of Maroka. I've got a blog there, the tonyladson.wordpress.com, which has got lots of RORB stuff. Um, yeah, and my email, I'm kind of old enough to remember that when Twitter and Instagram were kind of cool, but that sort of changed. <clears throat> First off, let me acknowledge a couple of people, David Stevens from Hark and Rory from University of Melbourne. So um, I've shamelessly borrowed their material with their permission. So some of the things that I'm talking about, some of the slides and case studies come from their work. Okay, so this is what we I'm going to cover. Uh, so what RORB does and what it doesn't do, uh, why you might want to think about using it, how it relates to Australian rainfall and runoff, um, and then a case study where we'll just talk about the inputs, the calculations and, and the outputs uh, and, and what's next. So what RORB, what RORB does, so it's a pretty simple model really. It, it uh, calculates flood hydrographs, usually from rainfall, so the graph that I'm showing there is sort of a typical RORB output with a hydrograph. Uh, it solves the routing equations using conservation of mass, as well as does a whole lot of bookkeeping to keep track of where the water's going. So it's much simpler, simpler than a hydraulic model where you have to worry about energy and momentum as well as conservation of mass. But a strength of that simple approach is that it, it uh, it's quick to run, which means that you can explore multiple scenarios uh, and and test assumptions and explore things that you want to without um, without taking days to wait for model outputs. So why would why might you want to use it? Um, so it's been around. The first release was somewhere around 1975. Now, normally you wouldn't consider software all, uh, good just because it was old. That's probably the opposite. Um, but it has been kept up to date. We're at something like version uh, 5.6 or so and it happily runs under Windows 11. Uh, so it's going strong at the moment. Uh, a big plus for it in the state that I live in, in Victoria, is that it's supported by Melbourne Water, which is a, a major water authority. And um, one of the key uses is, is this before and after modeling of urban development. So Melbourne Water is interested in trying to uh, maintain post-development hydrology and flood peaks and things to pre-development levels and ROBs capable of doing that kind of analysis. Um, it's useful for retarding basin design. It's got lots of different features, features for that. Um, can use data from the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Data Hub and from the Bureau of Meteorology. That just plugs straight in. It, it can do the, the modern things that are recommended in AR&R, &R, the, the ensemble modeling of temporal patterns uh, as and well as Monte Carlo sampling of inputs things like rainfall depth, temporal patterns, losses to produce uh, Monte Carlo uh, assessment of outputs. Uh, you can calibrate your models to stream flow data. 
and it's pretty easy to extract outputs to use as hydraulic model inputs. So commonly, we have a dual modeling process where the hydrology is often handled by RAW, and that provides input into a hydraulic model like two flow or, or whatever you like. So it's often used to estimate design flood hydrographs. That's where it's, it started. Um, it designed flood retarding basins, generate hydrographs for input to hydraulic models and calculate rainfall excess for, excuse me, rain on grid modeling. So if you, part of the, um, the way that RAWB is sort of uh, evolved is that it was developed really to this to do this design flood hydrographs at, at a rural site and a dam. I think it was probably Thompson Dam in the 1970s. And then then it was used for other things and they um they added capability to the program until it became sort of reasonably stable. Um but there's you know there's more things going in now like gate operations and that sort of stuff on big dams. So it's interesting to kind of reflect on why RAWB has been around for a while and has been reasonably been successful. So in, in modeling, there's a balance between uh, the predictive performance of the model, the available data and the model complexity, which is shown as a three-dimensional plot, wireframe plot here. So if we have um, a complicated model, but we can't support it with the data, then it doesn't provide very good predictions. It tends to, you have the overfitting problem. You can perfectly understand the past, but you can't predict the future very well. Uh, and then if we have a simple model, but a lot of data, then we can't extract the value out of the data. So, so the best models have that balance between complexity and data availability to provide reasonable predictive performance. And that's, that's where RAWB, that's kind of why RAWB survived for 40, 50 years is because it's been that reasonable balance between complexity and availability. So if we wonder, well, will we still be using RAWB in, um, 10, 20 years time. And I guess it depends whether it can sort of maintain that balance. So clearly the amount of data around is increasing all the time. So we've got, you know, digital elevation models, for example, that we didn't have before. So RAW needs to kind of be adapted to, um, uh, to cope with the, the new data. And then we've also got competing, other competing products like rain on grid modeling, which probably do take better account of things like digital elevation models. So so RAWB needs to adapt if it's going to remain relevant, and then it needs to fundamentally, I guess, compete with some of these other uh, other modeling packages. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how how it works out and and uh, what sort of report support it gets. Um, um, I, there was an interesting talk by uh, by Bill Simon at the hydro hydrology conference in December talking about where uh hydraulic hydraulic model is heading and, and certainly an interest in in rain on grid type modeling so so some things raw doesn't do it doesn't model kind of slower processes like evaporation transpiration soil moisture movement and redistribution and groundwater recharge and and discharge that's because it's a flood model so it's mainly focused on uh hydro, hydrological processes that take place over a few hours whereas these sort of processes on the slide there are probably more like relevant for a, a week or so. So if you've got, if they become, if you've got a flood that's lasting a week or so, you might need to take these into account. And you can, there are, there are features in RAW where you can add and subtract water from reaches. So you could potentially include something, but um, it doesn't automatically like read in uh, evaporation data and, and calculate loss and that sort of thing, like some more, um, uh, rainfall runoff type uh, modeling as opposed to runoff routing. So um, that, that they can handle that sort of thing much better. Um, it doesn't do hydraulics. It doesn't calculate velocities or depths. So, uh, but you can, of course, take the output rule and put that into a hydraulic model. So I'm going to move on to a case study, but perhaps, Cray, if I just stop there for a sec and um, see whether you wanted to, whether there was any uh, in comments or whatever. Yeah, let's let's have Matt come on because again, there's there's tons of questions already coming in, and thanks. Um, this is great to see these coming in uh, this this early. And I guess one uh, one definition I kind of wanted to get out of the way in the beginning because routing is included um, here uh, in the name of the program. Um, I guess I'm a long time HMS user, and things are separated. There is there are transform methods, so you 
take the rainfall and you transform it as it runs off into an individual basin and then you route it if it goes into a reach um, and so you either transform it or you route it uh, I assume there, there's that's kind of both built in here but on those definitions then when we talk about routing um, are you going to differentiate between uh, transform uh, and uh, and routing I guess that'd be weird. yeah yeah Craig, it's 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 a similar concept to what you've just described so the way world works internally and Tony, I'm sure we'll get to this, but um, essentially the rainfall falls on a lumped sub area and then that's converted through a loss model to rainfall excess. And then that rainfall excess is introduced into the routing model, which is, are the reaches um, and then routed from upstream to downstream throughout the model. Yeah, um, I guess that's what I'm getting to. It, it, Roar will do both, uh, obviously, and not just the right. routing. It's going to be transformed through the loss methods as well. Yep, that's correct. Cool. Um, do you want to take just maybe just select one of the questions here? Because again, we don't want to just remind everyone that this is interactive and that we are listening to your questions and these are getting answered in the background. Those who watch this in, on YouTube later on won't see these questions. We'll post them as a PDF uh, later on. Uh, but so if you could just kind of restate, maybe take one that you think is most relevant to what we've talked about in the intro so far, uh, just to let people know we're listening to them. Give us a quick answer and then we'll go back to Tony, get the case study out of the way and then come on for the panel discussion because I think it will be a very, uh, engaging uh, discussion here with people answering or asking questions in real time. Yep, sure. I'll try and add more detail in the Q&A for this question, but the most highest value one at the moment is a question regarding uh, catchments where there's no gauge data to calibrate the model, uh, which method is more appropriate for flood assessment, hydraulic modeling or rain on grid, sorry, hydraulic modeling with rain on grid or a hydrologic model like Rob. And uh, the thing I'd say is that the, the pros and cons of rain on grid um, rain on grid is much more appropriate for modeling complex flow paths and hydraulics, particularly for sort of urban areas. Um, but because of the runtime of hydraulic models, uh, you can't represent the uh, variability in rainfall as much. So different temporal patterns and um, different losses and um, all the things that you sort of consider in an ensemble or Monte Carlo framework. So depending on the balance of um, the type of catchment you're working in, whether it's relatively urbanized, um, the size of the catchment, um, how those different um, factors are likely to contribute to your um, floods at your points of interest will determine which method is more appropriate. All right. In the time you uh, took to answer that question, uh, we've had m about five <laughs> additional unanswered questions on there. So uh, Matt's going to be frantically typing while Tony gives us a case study, and then we'll come back on uh, for a panel discussion. Okay. I'll plow ahead. So I'm going to talk about uh, Delatite River at Tonga Bridge. So I know we've got a um, an international audience, so let's start with the blue marble. There's the earth with uh, centred on Australia. Um and I'm talking to you from the yellow dot down there in Melbourne. So the Delatite River at Tonga Bridge is down in uh, in Victoria in the southeast. Um, so let's zoom in. It's about 150 kilometres northeast of Melbourne or so. Um, it's in the, sort of the edge of the mountains. There's a ski resort in the in the headwaters there at Mount Buller, um, and then flows down through uh, forest land to the to the um, more through farmland. There's the catchment area which is about 368 square k's, and there's a gauge there uh, at uh, at the outlet Tonga Bridge. So although it's not common to need a model right where there is a stream flow gauge, you do often want to use stream flow gauge data to check and calibrate your model. So I guess we're just, uh, it's a bit of a toy example in the sense that I'm going to just focus right where we've got the data, but commonly you'll be using data in some form. Um, there's an aerial photo showing the forested headwaters and the uh, the streamlines and the uh, the gauge. Um, so we need to tell Rob about the catchment. It needs information on the catchment. And the catchment uh, description is defined by nodes and links where the nodes represent sub catchments or sub areas. Um, the model uh, puts some rain on those sub areas and converts that into, into stream flow. The links represent reaches and the model routes water through the reaches to the next node where it's combined uh, with the uh, the next hydrograph that's formed and so on as it moves through the system where there's a junction, it'll add the hydrographs from the two, uh, where the, the two branches and, and continues on downstream. Calculations are performed at a time step. So you can imagine if we're running through the model, there'll be rainfall, usually in the early time steps, that'll set up hydrographs 
that are generated at each of the nodes and they're routed uh, through the through the links through the reaches uh, added and uh, moved on as as um, as the system as the as the uh, time steps increase and as the uh, as the water moves from from rainfall through to runoff and then ultimately down through the outlet, uh, which is where we're interested in this case. Uh, so we you can use a graphical editor to define the um, the various features of of the nodes. So from to the sub areas, so we we can define the uh, the catchment area um, uh, in the. And maybe if we're working in an urban area, we'd be looking at the fraction impervious as well. So that that's a, we it can be done in a dialogue. Similarly, with a reach, we define the length of the reach and and the reach type. So a reach type could be a natural reach, which we've got in this case, or in an urban area, you'd define it as some appropriate urban type reach, whether it's uh, piped or channeled or something like that. And potentially, you may need to define the slope of the reach depending on the reach type. Um, you don't when you're clicking through you don't have to uh slavishly click on each node and each link at a time you can um uh, use tables to uh generate the um and and populate the, the numbers that you need so it, it can be quick you can also take data from a gis and plug that into raw there's some tools off to the side that um, enable that to happen and matt Matt knows about that. If if you're interested in that, you can, we can ask a question later on. Um, so once we define the catchment, when we tell raw where it is, so in this instance where we've got the uh, the Delatite cat G file, which is defining the catchment. So I'll just go back there. Um, sorry, I'll just go back to this one. You can see that you don't necessarily need to define every single blue line on the map. Um, you you just need to you do need to find every area. But you don't necessarily need to define heaps and heaps of of streamlines. Um, you can just select those that are uh, that are relevant, and you'd need to keep your um, sub areas of of a similar similar size. So, um, uh, so if you need small sub if you need small sub areas somewhere, then you probably need a lot of small areas, which is kind of why you want to keep the sub areas um, reasonably large if you can. Uh, you also need about five nodes so that you've got a reasonable amount of routing before you get a, a kind of proper hydrograph to look at so you so you need to have a few few uh catchments upstream of the of where you're interested so you, yeah so we can load in the catchment uh file in the dialogue the next thing we want to do is put in some rainfall there's a, there's a spot in the dialogue for that so there's two main types of rainfall that you put into a raw model um, you can either use rainfall, well, you tend to either use rainfall from a historical storm. So that's usually used for calibration. So usually you try and find a large historical storm where you had data on stream flow and rainfall. Uh, you collect all the local pluvio data and all the stream flow data, and you specify the rainfall within the model, and then you can check the flows with um, what actually occurred as part of calibration. That's one one use one input of rainfall. The other one is to use design rainfall based on intensity, frequency, duration data. And in Australia, we're fortunate in that uh, we've got design rainfall available everywhere in Australia, which is kindly supported by the Bureau of Meteorology via a web interface, and it's freely available. So we can just upload the table of um, design values in into RORB. So we've got. This is just how it comes off the web. We've got durations from one minute to 168 hours and rainfall intensities that go from up to the 1% and then and then more common. Um, and we you can see that, um, uh, for example, here, the 48 hour 1% rainfall is 193 millimetres. So we're not, we're certainly not in the tropics, uh, but you can see that even, even um, floods can certainly cause problems in this kind of a catchment. 193 mils in 48 hours would be a lot of rain for, for this area. So we just plug that in. Um, we just load that IFD rainfall into RAW. That's quite straightforward. There's a, a section here where we can specify the spatial pattern of the rain. So if the catchment's larger than about 20 square Ks, we'd normally want to specify the uh, spatial uh, 
uh, pattern of the rainfall. And you can do that by downloading a grid of IFD values and then and specifying um, the, the, the spatial pattern uh, using those. That's reasonably straightforward. Uh, okay, so that's the rainfall depths. We also are interested and need to load in rainfall temporal patterns. So again, in Australia, um, these are straightforward to get. They're available across the whole country at the Australian Rainfall and Runoff Data Hub. You just type in your location, which is the blue area there, and download a zip file with all of the uh, temporal patterns. That's straightforward. The only thing I'd say about that is that you definitely want to plot the temporal patterns up to make sure that they're reasonable. So for each duration, and here I'm plotting up the temporal patterns for the 48-hour duration uh, for 500 square kilometer area, which is the appropriate specification for our delatite catchment. And I'm using the Murray Basin region because delatite catchments are uh, in the Murray Basin. So I've got I've got my 10 for every duration uh, AEP area combination. There's 10 patterns, and I've so I've plotted all 10 there, and you can see that that there's a couple of patterns or at least one pattern that, that doesn't look like the others, this one here, pattern five, where we've got a large amount of rainfall occurring in a small time period. So each of these um, patterns is 24 increments of two hours each, and each column represents the percentage of the total rainfall, which is about 193 millimetres, as we saw before. It's the percentage of that rain that occurs in each 24-hour 24 two hour block. So this particular two hour block had more than 50% of the rainfall in the entire storm. So as part of another project, I've, I've looked at some of these issues around temporal patterns and there's a few where there's some problems and it's, it's probably because uh, some daily rainfall was misinterpreted as rainfall occurring over a short period. So in uh, hydrology, we call that an unflagged accumulation. So of the thousand or so patterns on the um, on the web, there's about nineteen or so where there's this problem with the with the unflagged accumulation. And to deal with that, so I'm saying plot the patterns up, and if you've got a problem pattern, just leave it out. We're all work quite happily with with nine patterns. Um, so yeah, or look, I I wrote a conference paper on this which just lists all the problem patterns. So you can check that and just don't use the ones that are causing you trouble. Um, also look at whether the the order in which the rainfall occurs. So if you look at pattern one, it's pretty uniform. If you look at pattern two, it's what we would call backloaded, where most of the storm happens at the end. Uh, pattern eight is the same. And then some of them are, are front-loaded, like pattern 10. So different catchments will respond differently to whether a storm is front-loaded or back-loaded, which is why the recommendation in ARNR is to use multiple patterns, because it's not easy to tell in advance what is the critical uh, feature of a rainfall pattern that's driving the flood response of the of the catchment. And the assumption is that each of these patterns are equally likely. So it's fine to take the mean or the median of the response as, as the catchment response. We can also look at the patterns as cumulative curves. So this is the same deal as the, um, the uh, column graph I showed before, except for we're just always starting the starting all the, all the patterns down here at zero, and they all finish up here at 100%. So this is the storm duration on this axis. This is the proportion of the rain. So after we go through 100% of the storm duration, we end up with 100% of the rain. But you can see that's, that um, I mentioned pattern two and pattern eight were uh, backloaded. So nothing much happens at the start of the storm, but then you get all the rain at the back. And pattern 10 was front loaded. So we've got a lot of rain happening at the front and then not much at the end. Um, four is sort of through the middle, and then five, we've got these two big sort of jumps, which don't look realistic, where we 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 basically got all the rain in two segments. So we can look at them together, um, just emphasizing that point that uh, the backloaded ones, uh, two and eight, front loaded one ten, and then the and the five with the with the steps, the stair steps. <clears throat> um, okay. So we just load the temporal pattern data in once we've checked it and cleaned it and, and got rid of any problems. Um, okay, the next thing we need to load is some information from the ARNR data hub, and that's mainly about aerial reduction factors. 
So an aerial reduction factor is just a factor that converts the rainfall intensity as measured at a stream gauge, at a rain gauge, sorry, which has an area of about 0.01 of a square metre, so quite small, that sort of size, to the rainfall intensity suitable for a catchment, which is millions of square metres. So it's a factor that takes that uh, area difference into account. It's quite a complicated formula there on the slide, but you don't need to worry about the detail because all um, what raw when you plug the file in, it's just providing these constants to Rob, and then Rob does the maths to come up with the with the number, which it varies from you know like zero to one. So that's straightforward. Just plug the data in, and Rob will do the maths for you. Uh, okay, other things we need uh, we need routing parameters. Um, a KC and an M, usually M is fixed at 0.8, and the KC depends on the catchment. So you can get that through calibration with a historical event if you have one, or you can use literature values. So if, you, if you're in ROB and you press on this double question mark, it'll suggest some values to consider. Uh, the other thing we need is some losses, an initial loss and a continuing loss. And um, you can get that from the data hub or from, from other studies. Uh, I'll show that in a little, a bit, bit more about losses in a moment. So if we click the plot button, we end up with our flood hydrograph. So here's our 48 hour, 1% AEP, single uh, pattern. Uh, and then that's been converted into a hydrograph at the outlet. So up here, the, so this is the hydrograph, the red, with a peak of 120 cubic metres a second. Up here is the rainfall. And we've got a clear outline as well as some blue. The clear outline is where the programs got rid of the initial loss of the rainfall and then taken off the continuing loss uh, at each time step. Um, so that's probably that the transformation that um, Cray was talking about. So that's a, just a single pattern. Um, and you can see that that coincides, it's a slightly different scale between pattern one that I showed you before when we were plotting up all those patterns. So it's just showing the hydrograph for pattern one. So we could then, the next step up in complexity is to run ensembles, ensemble of pattern. Um, and Rob will just do that automatically. And you can see, so the, here, here we are, we've run all of, all of the patterns. Um, we can see that some of them are much bigger. So five and eight are quite large and, and two. And remember, two and eight were the backloaded ones and five was the one with the spike. So clearly this pattern is, this tech, um, catchment is sensitive to sort of backloaded storms. Um, yeah, so pattern five is causing high peak and then the two backloaded ones, two and eight, where most of the rain is at the end. Um, we can look at individual patterns as well. Um, if we want to explore, just run individual patterns through Rob. There's that pattern five, eight, uh, if we want to check and see what's going on. So as I said before, um, we, we often want a single hydrograph to take forward. Uh, and we're assuming that every pattern is equally likely. So we can choose the average, an average in some way. We could average the peaks once, once we got rid of the patterns we don't believe are correct, we could then average the peaks, choose a hydrograph and scale it, or we can, that's one thing that people do. The other one is to take the median, figure out the median, the median of 10, so it's halfway between two, and then you want to take the one that's just above uh, and adopt that as your uh, design hydrograph to take forward. So it'll be the rank five or six, depending on whether you're counting from the, the top or the bottom. Um, so that that tends to be again another another sort of thing that people do. Uh, okay, so Monte Carlo. Um, that's this is the next step up in complexity where we can get Rob to sample rainfall depth, temporal pattern, initial loss, and duration. So let's look at the dialog for that. So it's a bit same as before. We we get the data from the data hub, which specifies the area reduction factor. Um, we get the temporal patterns and plug them in. We get the IFD data on rainfall and plug that in. For the simulation details, we specify Monte Carlo. Um, we It'll use a range of AEP, so we don't need to specify that. We select the durations we want it to look at, and I've said 12 hours to 168 hours. But you can go as you like, provided you've got the data to support the, um, 
uh, the durations that you've put in. So the reason I've stopped at 12 hours is because I'm using um, a, a series of temporal patterns that don't go below 12 hours. They're called aerial temporal patterns. So there's none of none that are available for shorter than 12 hours. So that's why I've stopped it at 12. I guess if you've, if 12 hours starts to look critical, then we need to look below 12 hours and to check if 12 hours isn't critical, then um, we're probably okay. Uh, we can filter embedded bursts, which is a way of getting around a situation where we've got some unusually heavy rainfall that's occurring within a pattern, like we saw with that pattern five with the two, two um, high uh, uh, burst it, it would deal with that sort of thing to some extent, but I but personally, I think that pattern is in error. So I'd probably get rid of it rather than try and filter it. You can apply pre burst. That's something that's in AR and R, which I haven't really talked about, but uh, we want to include the rainfall that will occur before the design burst that we're putting in. That's a standard approach now. Um, we want to use the, uh, uh, the aerial reduction factors from the file, from the, from the um, data hub file. And I've turned the regional losses off because I wanted to type in my own losses and not use the ones from the data hub because they the ones losses from the data hub tend to be a bit too big. Uh, okay, so we'll, we go on to the next dialogue where we specify how Monte Carlo is going to sample um, the rainfall, um, how it's going to sample the temporal patterns, how it's going to sample the initial loss. It's going to do a Monte Carlo. You can set the initial loss as a constant or sample from it. And we press go and it'll churn through a large number of durations, patterns, rainfall depths, initial loss, and come up with a rainfall frequency curve where we can see the, the, your, the rainfalls that are uh, important for your duration. So if we look at the, the one in 100, um, which is often the one we're interested in, so the highest um, peak flows are occurring with the blue line, which is the 24 hour pattern, and we're getting a peak of about 330 cubic metres per second there for the 1% flood. So given that the 24-hour duration seems to be the critical one for that um, AEP, we could then go back and explore the patterns and the particular uh, hydrographs for that duration if we wanted to. The other really important thing that we can do, which is, is the best way to calibrate a model, is to compare the uh, the frequency curve from our rainfall model with the frequency curve from stream flow. So um, we've got a gauge, uh, the Tonga uh, Delta River Tonga Bridge. So we've got, um, we can generate a um, flood frequency curve for that gauge. And then we could plot our point on, uh, which came from our rainfall modeling. So you can see that was about 330 cumics. And here the flood frequency curve for the 1% flood is something like 450. So we're a bit low, but we're still within the confidence limits. So what we can do is um, we can tweak the losses. The losses are possibly a bit high. We can tweak the losses until we get um, the output from the model being close to the output from the flood frequency analysis. Uh, we could check with other um, uh, AEPs just and try and match it across a full range. So, so we could go back and tweak it and, and um, calibrate the model until we're happy that we're generating the sorts of uh, peak flows that match uh, with what's measured. Um, uh, so, so the conclusion is, so what we've done, what we looked at in the case study, we've specified the catchment, the sub areas and the reaches. We've specified the input uh, rainfall as IFDs, temporal patterns, aerial reduction factors. We've specified routing parameters and losses. We've run RORB, we've produced simple hydrographs, ensemble hydrographs and Monte Carlo hydrographs. Uh, we've compared the outputs to a stream flow based uh, flood frequency analysis. And we could go back and then tweak the model and change the losses, the initial loss and continuing loss um, to tune the model up and then get something that's fit for purpose to model the hydrology of the Delatite River. So that's it for my case study. Um, uh, Perhaps if I could hand over, hand back to Cray. So what's next? Um, this is the so uh, this is the pre-course uh, webinar for a course that's coming up. This Royal Essentials for Water Modeling course. But we've also included here some other courses 
that have either been done or coming up for from the Australian Water School and including free webinars. So I don't know whether you wanted to mention anything there, Craig? No, just that, um, yeah, there, there's plenty of resources uh, for you that we have available to you. And, you know, it's going to differ depending on where you're coming to us from, you know, international, uh, uh, you know, some of the things that we've got on here, the hydrology and hydraulics essential series is truly global and international. And, um, you know, it, 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 it would be applicable to everyone. Certain courses like this one uh, will be specific to Australia. We'll get into some of those questions uh, in the Q&A bit that came from, you know, uh, people locally versus uh, internationally. But um, yeah, just have a look at uh, these links and we hope you find something useful here for your career. I do think if you're in Australia and you're going to be <laughs> looking at rainfall and runoff, uh, knowing how to uh, run something in ROARB is going to be absolutely uh, essential. Come along to the course. Some of it will include some additional resources that have already been uh, developed and uh, have the input from those experts um, that uh, we've already, uh, that, that Tony introduced in the beginning, um, uh, David Stevens and uh, Rory Nathan as well. So we, you'll, you'll get some of their materials as well if you sign up for this course you see the details there uh, on the course that's going to be taking place in a few weeks time so you got a few weeks to prepare for it uh, get that submitted um, and we do hope to see you there with that uh, let's bring Matt back on as well um, it's uh, we, we may we may go a few minutes over here we'll try to get to as many of these as we can um, really I'll just uh, maybe I'll just turn it over to you Matt just initially to just hit a couple of the questions that were upvoted the most, uh, and then we'll we'll break into a discussion uh, at that point uh, when we start uh, r running out of time here because we're not going to be able to get to uh, all of them. Obviously, tremendous yeah. amount of interest in this subject, so uh, that 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 does definitely justify uh, ha having a, a follow up course on this. Uh, so over to you, Matt. Uh, what, what do you want to hit? Yep, sure. Um, so th there's lots of questions. I'm doing my best, but if people could um, upvote the questions they're most interested in, that will help me prioritize them. Uh, in terms of ones that are most updated at the moment, um, one question we've been getting today and continue to get is, are there any plans to de develop a QGIS plugin for RAW, <laughs> uh, much like the Map Info and ArcMap plugins? Uh, we, we would like to. Um, it is something I would like to do. I'm a QGIS user myself. Um, it's just a challenge of finding a way to fund a plugin like that. Um, because obviously we're, we're consultants, we're not software developers, so um, we need to be able to find the time to do that plugin. And any um, any plugin work we do does take away from the sort of maintenance and feature development of Rob itself. So it sounds like the appetite is there, but we, we just need to find a way to do it. Um, and another question that's um, here as well is about uh, the embedded burst filtering, which um, Tony's already touched on, um, about when that's sort of relevant and how it sort of works. Um, so it's a, it'll be a bit more detailed than what I can sort of go into here, but generally the embedded burst filter is intended to adjust the temporal patterns such that um, when you're combining a burst depth of a particular AP with a temporal pattern, that any given window within that scaled temporal pattern doesn't exceed burst steps for other APs for other burst durations, which you might be modeling. So it's, it's a very sort of uh, embryonic sort of part of the um, state of knowledge in, in hydrologic modeling. So um, it definitely does require some engineering judgment, but I will chuck in a paper reference into the Q&A where you can find more details on that. Excellent. Mm. And so um, just a quick question then, um, when we're talking about these, um, you know, the, the GIS interface, um, I've, I've, I've tried it before with, you know, with Arc Hydro and things like that. There's pre-processing. So um, uh, we, we saw Tony's map there uh, that, that showed the catchments and the delineations and the flow paths. And, you know, we've got courses on how to do that in QGIS. We also have courses on how to do that in HEC HMS. And um, you can do it in Global Mapper. You can do it in Arc Hydro. If you didn't have the plugins, and you didn't have the software that you know uh, interacts with um, you know map info or some other plugin and you were using QGIS or HMS or some software to do that and now you have that GIS um, just to talk a little bit about how whether that's a disadvantage in just taking that and going straight into ROARB with it without the uh, without the plugins and interfaces yeah so unfortunately if 
the catchment model has been created in a GIS package that we don't have a plugin for. Uh, at the moment, the only way to get that information into Rob is to retranscribe it manually. So essentially going through creating sub-area nodes and transcribing what the areas are um, by hand, essentially. Um, potentially you could write a, a macro or a Python script to construct that catchment text file for you. But um, generally speaking, if you can use a GIS package which has the plugin, your life's going to be much easier, both from not having to do that manual transcription and um, just from sort of quality assurance, you know, you're less likely to make a mistake if you're not having to transcribe all that information. Excellent. All right. Um, Tony, in the meantime, have you had a chance to just glance through any of these questions? Anything that you wanted to highlight? Um, I'll let Matt uh, select his next question, but anything from mm. what's come in on the, on the chat line uh, that, that you wanted to highlight? Um, I, I suppose I can continue on the embedded burst question. Um, it, it is an important thing. So one of the you you don't necessarily need to rely on on Rob or um, an automatic process to just check if you've got an issue. So I, I showed how you can get the individual hydrographs for the um, if you're running the temple patterns. If you've got one that's sticking right up there and the peak's high, you can then go and look at that pattern. And um, like for example, one of those patterns that had fifty percent of the rainfall. Uh, of a 48 hour event occurring in two hours. So I said the, the rainfall depth was 193 millimeters. Um, if you look at half that, say 100 mil occurring in two hours, you go back into the IFD data in, in from the Bureau and see what the A annual sequence probability is of a two hour storm that's got 100 mils in it. You'll see it's way, way over 1%. It'll be like, one in two thousand or more, it'll be probably outside the range of what's on the on the bureau website. So um, th that's kind of one of the reasons I think it's important to plot up those um, patterns and and also do to explore which of the patterns are leading to the, to these huge hydrographs that are if there are any hydrographs that sort of look a bit odd, and then you can check. And if it's um, if it's a problem, well then. Either you can exclude that if you don't believe it's correct, and I and I, as I mentioned, I've got a list of the nineteen patterns that I think have errors in them. Um, or alternatively, turn on the embedded filtering, and it'll make sure that um, the internal patterns, are, uh, the AEP of the internal any any window, as as Matt mentioned. So in this in the example I'm giving, it'd be a two hour window make sure that the AEP of the rain in that two hours is similar to the AEP of the whole whole big, you know, 48 hour duration burst. So uh, it's it's kind of partly checking and making sure that the, the model's doing what you expect and and what you believe and what, what you believe is right. Because you, um, I think you want to check everything personally. <laughs> I know that takes time, but you don't want to assume that, um, the stuff that you download is necessarily perfect. Yeah. No, Spend a bit of time checking. Yeah. And and I guess back to, a, a, you know, there's probably four or five questions on different methods and how they compare. Um, when, you know, if, if somebody just takes and puts a rainfall pattern, you know, an applied excess uh, hydrograph to a rain on grid model, and you run it mm -hmm. and you just say that's the answer um, unless you've gone in and uh, you know checked it a number of different ways that answer doesn't actually mean anything because I can mm -hmm. I can adjust roughness coefficients within a reasonable range of coefficients to match a certain peak flow for you know to match my rain on grid model to my ROB results likewise I could take my ROB model and change the KC value until I get to the you know what I get out of the rain on grid results, and so you can tweak these numbers. You just ha you do have to have a feel for what you're trying to get to based on reality. Yeah. Um, if you don't have that, the physical mechanisms we're trying to re you know represent with a rain on grid model, you know where you've got uh, millimeters or centimeters of flow in a 5, 10, 20, 50 meter grid, trying to work through hydraulic equations to move from one cell to the next, and you know and accumulate that way, you know versus what's actually occurring in reality with inter flow and you know tra transmission losses and things like that things that are you know the the abstraction and everything that's going on hydrologically in your catchment 
um, you've got to have some sort of sense of reality because otherwise the number that you put out there might, you know, is, is just a guess and you may as well just use the rational method if that's all you're going to be doing. So hopefully mm -hmm. some sort of sense of reality uh, and, and a comparison there would be all right. Um, can we talk uh, just real quickly about the KC value? There were a few questions that mentioned the KC value and some people might not be familiar with that term. And I think, I think it's called the storativity coefficient. Um, uh, Matt, Matt, well, just anything um, that, uh, that that we'd want to hit with um, with the storativity coefficient and um, how, what what that means. What what does that represent? Could you have a, a, a you know, like a physical representation of what that might mean? Yep, sure. So um, I haven't gotten to answer the questions yet about KC. So apologies if I'm doubling up on anything with this. But um, so essentially, the KC uh, describes. Um, the attenuation of flows throughout the catchment. So when it's higher, the hydrograph becomes more sort of fatter and extended in time. Um, it doesn't affect the overall volume of the hydrograph. That's only losses that do that. Um, and um, one thing that's really important, it's a question I get all the time with KC is, People have set up their raw model and they've gone and calibrated it and then later have added in a new gauge into the raw model and are wondering why they're then getting different answers. And a really important thing in raw is that the AC value, which, as I've said, drives this attenuation in the model, is normalised against the average distance to the most um, the next downstream gauge in the model. So um, if you... Um, and that number is referred to as DAV in the catchment model. So one thing that's really important for people to know is that if they go back with their model and make changes to how the catchment representation is, they'll likely have to adjust their KC even if they've already calibrated the model. Excellent. No, thanks for that. Um, Tony, anything you, you want to add on uh, that discussion or if there's any other questions you wanted to hit as we start getting toward our last yeah, few minutes so here? KC is, is part of relating the flow in a reach to the storage in the reach, which then is important in the in the, the routing where you're solving the differential equation of inflow minus outflow because of change in storage in that time. So it's a critical parameter for that for the only complicated thing that's in raw, which is that which is the solution of the routing equation. So uh, it is fundamental and and has a big influence on the output. So it's important to get it right. And if you the way to do it, if if you possibly can, is to Estimate it by calibrating your model to historical events, and um, you've, you've, in those instances, you've got the rainfall, you've got the flow, um, so you can so you can get the losses because you know the volume of of runoff. So then you need a KC to make to to match your historical uh, flow. So ideally, um, calibrate the model on an historical event to get the KC. <laughs> I, ideally for all of you on the ideally. East Coast, uh, that's great for me here in Western Australia where we've got mines mm -hmm. going in where there's no records at all. Uh, that becomes a little more uh, more problematic. And that, that leads us to a couple of the other questions that came in from uh, other overseas attendees and those users of other software. You know, how, how does this compare? Um, one thing, if you wanted to take the Australian rainfall and runoff patterns um, and try to build them in, there is a third-party program called Storm Injector. We've got a, a, a course that includes that um, where we take uh, Storm Injector and use it to put uh, the Australian patterns into HEC HMS, for example. Um, if you don't have sub-daily records, if you don't have uh, the pattern information, the temporal pattern information in your area of the world, um, you, it may not be as useful to do what Tony just showed you, and you may be able to get by with something like the frequency storm, which is a uh, hypothetical storm that builds all the worst case um, temporal patterns into a single hypothetical event. Now, that's not probability neutral. Um, that's going to give you a worst case. That's not going to be one of these median ones that you pick out. Um, but in some areas of the world, if you don't have the data to support what Tony just showed you how to do, uh, maybe the worst case scenario is what you want to use as a bookend. Um, in uh, and, and I guess one of the things I wanted to mention as well, uh, just as we're getting toward the end of the time here, um, you mentioned these loss values, uh, uh, Tony, and mm. in, in some cases how that, that you know, it might be overestimated. Well, for some events, it might be overestimated. For others, it might not be. A lot of times, if you plug in the initial vo loss values right off the data hub, some of your lower events just get no runoff, where we know that, mm. you know, each year you're going to get runoff, um, but uh, it'll give you zero uh, coming out of it. Uh, any thoughts on 
on varying those parameters uh, based on uh, the magnitude of an event. Yeah, so the, so those losses on the data hub, I think people have realized that there's, there's some issues there, that they're potentially um, a bit high. There's been a specific study done for Victoria and there's some new recommended losses available, which, so if you look in the jurisdictional specific tab on the data hub, you'll find that there's um, specific information for losses in New South Wales and specific information for losses in Victoria. So, so if you're in Victoria and New South Wales, use those. In Tasmania, there's been a lot of um, modelling done because there was a contract to model a whole state as part of a, a, a big flood study. And those reports are all on the web where people have developed models, um, WMA Water, developed models and calibrated them. And you can see the sorts of losses that they've used in calibration. And um, oftentimes the losses that they've used in calibration are very, very small. So um, try and dig around and see uh, other reports and, and see what people have used. You, The best sort of calibration is calibration to a flood frequency curve, like I showed right at the end. If you calibrate, if you look at the losses that you've calibrated to a historical event, the actual losses during a large flood are going to be small. That's why the flood was large. So, so you don't necessarily want to use the calibration losses from an individual event. You want to use the calibration losses associated with matching the flood frequency curve. That's the best way to do it. But you need the data, of course. But if you don't have the data where you are, then try and look at what other people have done nearby. At least it gives an, gives an indication. No, oh, good. Perfect. Um, so what we might do with um, most of the remaining questions here, um, Matt, if you wanted to give some of your colleagues a crack at these uh, in the meantime, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how quickly they can respond, but hopefully by the time we post the recording of the webinar, we can have a PDF file of some of these questions and answers as well, and maybe uh, get, get a chance to uh, have you feel as attendees that you've been listened to today. Um, uh, many of you may feel uh, ignored. We hope we hit most of the upvoted ones, but there's, you know, we're, we're approaching 100 questions here and, uh, you know, technical questions that we would not have had time to answer during this uh, time frame. Uh, but hopefully if we kind of distribute these out a little bit, we can get some responses back on the uh, website uh, that uh, and, and you can just refer back to that and hopefully see the answer to the question that you might have posed. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll probably stop there with the technical uh, questions and leave it to uh, both of you to give us some closing remarks here. Um, while we're doing that, um, again, there's some links for future courses, some things coming up that are really cool. Uh, we've got something coming up that I'm really excited about. Uh, you see this buzzword, chat GPT, what's artificial intelligence mm -hmm. going to do to the water sector? I just typed in, uh, I, I just told uh, chat GPT to teach me ROARB, um, and it actually uh, came up with uh, reservoir operations as the RO. So um, some 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 ways to go, I think, on some of these things. But uh, <laughs> let's let's have a have a think about what we can do with some of these chat based uh, um, uh, sites um, and and applications. Um, and like I said, sign up for this uh, for this course coming up if you are interested in doing what you saw screenshots of, doing it live and interactively, and generating these things yourself. We'll get you through it. If you get stuck on something, you'll get through it. And uh, you know the instructors and panelists and presenters are going to be able to help you out um, so that we don't leave you hanging. If you just try it on your own, you might get stuck and give up. Come to the course and we'll get you all the way through it. So with that, let's have Matt uh, give some closing remarks first and then we'll have Tony uh, bring it home for us. Sure, yeah. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, as I say, I've tried to get to as many questions as I can, but we'll figure out some way to <laughs> um, work out how to get the rest of those answers to you at some point. Um, in terms of if you need any further broad support, um, uh, one thing you can do is you can email us at inquiries at hark.com.au. Uh, we also have a Rob forum as well, which um, we've been having some issues with, but you can definitely try and answer through there. And if you don't seem to be getting a response, just shoot us an email as well. Sounds good. All right, Tony, wrap it up for us. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd encourage people to try the Rob forum. I, I think that that's really quite good. I try and answer a few things on that when I can. Um, so really... Uh, I'm back on on the 20th of April doing more Rob. So um, keep that in mind if you're interested. I'll have a look through the questions and uh, I'll, I'll try and answer some in that course if as appropriate. So uh, or, or send them along and um, we'll try and uh, we'll try and address them. 
Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you to our volunteer uh, presenters and panelists today coming on. Thank you to you as our attendees. We hope you find this useful. Give us some feedback as you exit and let us know what you want to hear more of. Uh, we want to bring you the most relevant content uh, for professionals in the water sector here at the Australian Water School. Thanks for attending. We'll see you next time. Thank you.